In our last study, we left off in verse 15 of chapter 3 because we ran out of time. But today, I just want to finish verses 16 and 17 before we move on to the next section. Okay? So verse 16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another with all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. What I want to do today is just start out by looking at a couple of the words that Paul uses in verse 16 so we can understand more deeply what Paul is saying. Okay, He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let's just hang out here for one second. Okay, The word that he uses for word is the word logos. Okay, This is the same word that the Apostle John uses in his gospel in chapter 1 when he says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He says, he was in the beginning with God and all things were created through him and without him, nothing was made that was made and in him was life and that life was the light of men and light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not understood it. Okay, the word of God is the logos of God. It's very difficult to separate God from his word. God's word is imbued with his power, with his authority, with his presence, um, with his divinity. Um, it, you, you can see the power of God's word in, in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness hovered over the face of the deep. Verse 3 says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. This is the divine authoritative command of God, where he speaks his word, and his word moves forth to actually perform the will of God. This is the logos of God in action. It, you can see um, the connection between God and his word in verse 14 of John chapter 1, where he says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory, as of the only begotten of the Father. How do you separate God from his word? His word is powerful. In fact, Hebrews chapter 4 says his word is powerful. It's living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing to the soul and to the spirit, and to the joints and to the marrow, and, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God's word is powerful to transform, to, to enact his will. In fact, Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11, said, God through the prophet Isaiah says, so shall the word be that goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty or void, but it always accomplishes the purpose for which I have sent it. See, God's word carries his intention. It carries his power. It carries his divinity. It carries his authority, okay? And that's why Paul's telling us, let that divine, authoritative, powerful word of God dwell within you richly. In Deuteronomy 17, um, the Bible tells us how God commanded through Moses that when they went into the land and they set up a king over them uh, from among their brothers, he said that the king should write his own copy of the law and keep it with him day and night, that he would meditate on this, this law of God, the word of God, every single day, that his heart would not be lifted up or exalted. He would lead um, from, from, from this word of God. He would keep himself centered and abiding in God um, um, through his meditation on this word of God. And Paul's telling us something very similar. He's saying, let the word of God dwell in you richly. We see the authoritative command and power of God's word in, in, in the story of uh, John chapter 11, where, where Jesus calls Lazarus um, back from the dead. He's standing outside the, the, the grave and he says, roll away the stone. And, and Lazarus' sister's like, Jesus, it's been like four days. He probably already stinks in there, right? But he says, no, roll away the stone. And, and then he prays to the father and he says, Lazarus, come out. And the divine authoritative, the divine fiat of God goes forth and life comes back into the body of Lazarus and he walks out of the grave. When he's asleep in the stern of the boat on the Sea of Galilee and the wind and the waves begin to, 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 to churn up because the storm rolls in, right? And the disciples are panicking. They wake him up. Master, don't you even care that we're perishing? Jesus stands up and he looks around at the wind and the waves and he says, peace, be still. And the wind and the waves cease and a calm comes over everything. And the disciples say, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? This is the power inherent in the word of God. Paul saying, let that word, the word of Christ, the living and active and powerful authoritative word of Christ 
dwell within you. And this word dwell is related to the word for house, oikia, okay? And this word means literally to inhabit, like to move in and live within, okay? Let the, the authoritative, powerful, uh, divine word of God live and dwell within you. Like this is not just a, a visit here and there on Sundays. We go and we go and stay at the at the at the summer house, at the river house, at the beach house. No, no, this is let it come in and move in permanently and dwell within you, okay, richly, not sparsely. Like, hey, I remember I, I memorized John three sixteen in, in Sunday school in the third grade, right? Well, that's good. It's a good verse, but but that's not letting the Word of God richly dwell in you, okay? Let the Word of God richly dwell in. you you get okay, that same power the same word that has that power to call lazarus forth from the grave a dead man coming back to life the same power that that can speak to the wind and the waves and they calm the same power that can say let there be light and there was light that same power god can send with intention into my heart right it never returns to him void it always accomplishes the purpose for which he has sent it let him send that word into your heart to begin to transform you from the inside, to bring life where there is death, to bring incorruption where there's corruption, to bring immortality where there is mortality, to change me and form me into the image of Christ. Okay, let the word of God dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. This is a tough one, right? Because it's really easy uh, to be a teacher and it's really easy to be an admonisher um, but it's a little bit more difficult to be someone who's teachable, someone who's able to receive admonishment. But remember that just a couple verses ago, Paul was saying, this is what I want you to do. I want you to take off the old self um, and, and all the practices of the old self. And I want you to put on as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts and kindness and humility and meekness and patience and forgiveness and love, right? Because it takes a lot of humility it takes a lot of patience it takes a lot of meekness it takes probably some forgiveness and it takes a lot of love to be someone who can can be a person who is able to receive teaching able to hear and receive admonishment and, and an, an admonishment is not a rebuke it, it's more like a loving reminder it, it's like a gentle uh um, correction and reminder like hey, hey brother i noticed I think um, maybe this might be going on, but I just want to remind you uh, of this scripture and, and what the Lord told us here. And, and I want to encourage you, you know, and that's what admonishment is. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Okay? And when the word of Christ is dwelling in you richly, when you're being transformed by his spirit and by his power and by his word within you, you teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, that wisdom that comes from above. He says, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. In other words, just letting your whole life be saturated. Every moment, every experience, every day, just being saturated in the things of the Spirit, thinking on the things of God, um, thinking on the things of the Spirit. That's why in verse 1 of this chapter, he says, if you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on the things that are on earth right? But it's so easy in our culture to be distracted by the things of this earth. Like our cell phone, I'm, I'm doing this video on my cell phone right now. That cell phone is literally designed that the second I turn it off or set it down or put it in my pocket, it's going to buzz. It's going to beep. It's going to flash. It's going to do something. I literally just turned off all my notifications except for just one or two that I need to know. Okay, like if my family calls me or if I get a, like a text from them, like those are the only notifications that are allowed. But otherwise my phone will just want to distract me and pull me in and keep me staring at it like all day long. It wants me to look at Instagram reels and Facebook reels and TikTok reels. And it wants me to look at silly things and memes and wants me to watch Netflix all day long or my TV even like Netflix and Amazon Prime and, and HBO Max. And there's so many ways to be distracted in our world. But Paul is saying, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, like saturate yourself in the word. Well, it's not a bad thing to listen to secular, secular music or a secular show or watch a, a secular movie. Right. But 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 it's also easy. And, and with all the technology that we have to distract us, we can also just turn the Bible app on, on our phone, and let it just read scripture over us as we drive down the freeway or down the street. 
Like we just saturate ourselves. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, singing, um, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Like turn worship on. Listen to the saints of God worship. Worship with them while you're driving down the road. Like listen to a podcast of biblical teaching, thinking on the things of God. Like, like read the Bible when you have five seconds, like let it read it to you. But, but just, in other words, just saturate your mind and your body and your soul and your experience with the things of God, whatever's good, whatever's lovely, whatever's of good repute, think on these things. Okay. He says with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And how many times has Paul told us to be thankful in this letter? I'm already going too long, but how many times has he told us to be thankful? And why are we thankful? Because this is all the gift from him. Like he woke us up. He brought us alive spiritually. He, he's allowed us by the, by the, by his own grace and mercy through Christ to be a part of his family and his kingdom, to be a part of the body of Christ. Like we should be um, a community of people that is honest and, and, and loving and caring and kind and compassionate and truthful, but also thankful, just so thankful because everything we have is from his hand. And he says in verse 17, whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything, everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Okay, like listen to what he's saying here, okay? Whatever you do, like whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything. Does, does the word everything mean some things or a couple things or a few things or most things? <laughs> no, he's saying do everything. Whatever you do in word or in deed. So that means like covers everything, right? Anything you can do or say, everything you do and everything you say, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Imagine if we actually lived this way. Like I do some things in the name of the Lord Jesus, right? There, there's times when, when, I, when I'm being led by the Spirit and, and I'm feeling like, okay, I need to like be Christ to this person. I need to, to show them the love of Christ, compassion. I need to uh, meet this need. Like uh, there's times when I'm doing things in the name of the Lord Jesus. But, but what if I did everything? in the name of the Lord Jesus. So I don't do that right now. But like, what if I served customers at my shop in the name of the Lord Jesus? Like, how does that reframe my thinking about customer service and change how I do that? What, what if I drove my car everywhere I go in the name of the Lord Jesus? How does that change the way I drive and interact with other people on the road? Imagine if I parented my children all the time in the name of the Lord Jesus or said hello to my neighbors or, or conducted myself on social media or stood in line at the DMV or, 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 or visited a restaurant or, or joked around with my buddies? What, what if I talked about politics or, or, or debated theology in the name of the Lord Jesus? What if I loved my wife and my babies in the name of the Lord Jesus? Like, what if I did everything that I do every day in the name of the Lord Jesus. Like how, how, how would the way that I handle these things, how would the way that you handle things in your life change for the better? I, I'm betting that if we did this, if we did everything, focused on everything I do, I'm gonna do in the name of the Lord Jesus, it would change the way I live and interact with other human beings on this earth. And I bet you that our lives would make a bigger impact. We would impact the, the people and the culture and the world around us in powerful ways. But Paul says, whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. So Paul's telling us, put on Jesus Christ. Put on Christ. Put on his characteristics. Put on his attributes. Put on his compassion and his love and his peace and humility and his kindness. Put all of this and thank him in every moment for everything he's done and provided you. Why? Because when we thank him, when we thanking him for everything, acknowledging that everything we have is from him and it's not because we're so good and so cool. We're thanking him. It makes us cognizant and aware that nothing that I have it is because I'm so good and cool. It makes me aware that, that, that I should be grateful, that, 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 that I should also be gracious to the people around me. It makes me less apt to judge the people around me. It makes me more apt to be kind and compassionate and caring, to put myself in their shoes and realize that if not for the grace of God, there go I. This is the Christian life, and this is the picture Paul's trying to paint for us, that we should literally be being formed into the image of Christ in every moment of every day. It's not a face we put on when we go to church or when we feel like being Christian-y. Like every moment, 
we should be being transformed, letting the word of Christ dwell in us richly, letting the spirit of God transform us from the inside to the outside, making us into the image of our creator. We'll move on to the next section of the next video.